her words have not been spoken, especially in these last days. All my hope is in Jesus. As we're nearing World War III, uh, certainly at least a widespread Middle East war between Israel and Iran, uh, Bible prophecy coming to life before our very eyes, and record flooding from Hurricane Helene across the southeast and mid-Atlantic. And you probably noticed that our music that we featured here today, uh, All My Hope is in Jesus There, Kelly Mole's singing lead with our choir, is from our 2023 Fall Revival, not our 2024 Fall Revival with Pastor C.T. Townsend, because we had to cancel our 2024 Fall Revival due to Hurricane Helene. Uh, Pastor C.T., uh, he's pastor of a church there in North Augusta, South Carolina, right on the Georgia-South Carolina border, and they were unfortunately within the path of then-tropical storm Helene, and while the church, I believe, uh, came out okay, uh, there's members of the church who did not. Their houses uh, incurred damage, and Brother C.T., understandably so, knew that it was his place to be with his church during this time. And so uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of the widespread damage and how it's not being reported very often by the mainstream media, so we hope that you're listening to viable, true, truly objective news sources to get your news, like Real America's Voice, if we can put that plug in, um, to get the truth of what's happening on the ground there. Okay, uh, Brother Greg Lintz and Hearts with Hands, Samaritan's Purse, they're doing a great work out there. We need to pray for those ministries, and we need to pray for these families in Florida, Georgia, South and North Carolina, Tennessee, that were all severely impacted, especially those in Western North Carolina in and around Asheville, where it appears the damage is the worst, uh, people still missing, and so forth. So our prayers go out to these dear families, to our sister churches, to those who have boots on the ground there doing the Lord's work getting the gospel out and giving people the things that they need right now. Water, fresh water, uh, food, baby formula, diapers, um, bleach and, and, and disinfectant uh, wipes, things like that, and clothes, um, and so on. So let's be in prayer for what's going on. Then that somehow the Lord gets glory from all this. For those of you who are members of our church at Mount Pleasant, you you very well remember what happened to us eight years ago and how the Lord turned that cursing into a blessing and gave us something even greater than what we lost, than what we had before we lost. And pray that, and people got saved. People got saved because of that flood. And that's just our testimony. I'm sure that there's countless others in and around the area. Uh, as far as what the Lord did for them uh, through that trial. And so we pray that the Lord somehow, some way gets glory through this horrible, horrible disaster. We know this. He knew the damage it was going to cause. He could have prevented it, and he didn't. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Not just for, for a single person, but for every single person who loves the Lord. So even those somehow who tragically lost loved ones, the Lord is going to work this all together for good. Somehow, some way, we may never understand it in this life. But when we get to heaven and we know, even as also we are known, we will praise him for his wisdom, his grace, his power, and how he worked it all together. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, with that said, and I don't know that there really needs to be said much more, we'll talk about Judgment Island next hour, so we'll just take that down. Uh, we just need to go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to begin our Bible study. We appreciate you joining us tonight for two hours, Lord willing, as we study Genesis in the first hour, Matthew in the second hour. And uh, we know you could be doing any number of things right now whenever you're listening or watching this and you've chosen to study God's Word. And 
And folks, there's no greater oasis than the word of God in prayer. No greater oasis. Where else are we going to go in times like this? Okay. And we find such great comfort and consolation from God's word and from prayer. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll jump right into our study here tonight. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus tonight, that all of our hope is in him. And it is a rightly placed hope. Our hope is not a, a something that has any degree of uncertainty. In your word, hope is certainty and assurance and waiting. And we're thankful that no matter what it is that we're going through here tonight, that we can put our hope and trust in you and we are anchored fast. And we do pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are, who are suffering here tonight, Lord. Those in Florida and Georgia, South Carolina and North Carolina and Tennessee, those who were in the path of this storm, who've suffered floods that even far worse than what we went through eight years ago. And Lord, we just pray that what you did for us, and even more so you do for these dear saints of God, and for the people in these communities, Lord, may somehow the love of God through the Lord Jesus Christ and your people shine forth in these communities, Lord, that as we saw when we went through the flood, how God's people rallied together and, and provided in such a way there was an abundance, even above what was needed to, uh, for, the, for, the, for the need at hand. Lord, I pray that you, you move and motivate your people to do the same here. We pray people get saved as a result of this. We pray you get the glory somehow, some way, and that you wrap your everlasting arms around those who've lost loved ones, who've lost all that, they, that they've saved for, everything in, in, as far as their livelihood, their home, their belongings. And Lord, we just pray that somehow, some way, they find comfort and consolation in you tonight because you are all we need. We ask that you bless our lesson here tonight and may something that is said would be a blessing and a help to your people, that it lifts up the Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, folks, let's, let's seek our refuge in the Word of God, shall we? Uh, Genesis chapter 2 is where we're at. We're still on the topic of creation and will be until we complete chapter 2. We left off at verse 7, and I don't know that we're going to move very far here tonight as far as... Uh, uh, verses are concerned because there's still a lot to unpack from verse number seven, which gives the details regarding the creation of man. Of course, the creation of man introduced there on the sixth day of creation in Genesis 1, um, but now we see details of it here in verse number seven, where it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. A lot to talk about here. We Last week we talked about the Lord forming man here in verse 7, and that speaks specifically to his body, because he's forming man from the dust of the ground. Our soul and spirit, the immaterial, the eternal part of man, the part of us which never ceases to exist, did not come from the earth. It came directly from God, as we see at the latter part of this verse, because the soul and spirit came into being when God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. The body was formed from the dust of the ground. All right, so like the Lord, uh, like a potter, I should say, forms a vessel from clay, so the Lord formed the body of man from the dust of the ground. And we're going to talk about this dust, first of all, here. What a, what a choice of words here, dust. Because when we think of dust, we think of something that is very insignificant. And that really is part of the point here, is when we think about the intricacy and the beauty of the human body, even in its post-fall state, Okay, and David talks about this in Psalm 139, marveling 
at the human body and the growth and development of the human body, even at the genetic level. Um, it truly is a marvel. Again, um, for people who peer through a microscope or a telescope and walk away and say there is no God, they're not paying attention. They're not going into it with an objective and open mind because there is no way that you can look into a telescope or into a microscope and see the order and the intricacy and the complexity and yet the simple precision of it all and not walk away believing that there is an intelligent creator at work in these things from the vastness of the cosmos to the subatomic uh, particles and so forth. Okay, So the Lord forms man of the dust of the ground. This is the first appearance, obviously, of the word dust. It appears 108 times in the Bible, which is a product of 18 and 6. And 6 is the number of man, so no surprise there. But 18 is 6 plus 6 plus 6. So isn't that interesting? Dust and man, like clay and man, go hand in hand. So it is no surprise here that... The word dust 108 times, which is 18, or 6 plus 6 plus 6, times 6, the number of man. And there's a number of different scriptures that identify man as dust. We think of Genesis 3.19. That's probably the first one that comes to everybody's mind because when we talk about man's body being formed from the dust, we immediately think about how that at physical death, the body returns from whence it came, to the dust. Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, the Lord says there, and unto dust shalt thou return. Then in Genesis 13.16, the seed of Abraham collectively is likened to the dust of the earth. The Lord says to Abram there, that's his name at the time, Abram, not Abraham. He says, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. So we, when we think about dust, we think of something that is insignificant because if it's, if it's small size, dust is particles. And yet the Lord uses it to liken the number of Abraham's seed when the Lord's done blessing him. Because dust is so small, it accumulates in vast numbers. Then we have Genesis 18, 27, where Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. So again, dust representing insignificance. Okay, lack of importance. And it becomes a long, and that expression there, dust and ashes, becomes an expression and that is representative of repentance and humiliation, humbling before God. Job 4.19, how much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. Uh, and then I think we have one more, Psalm 103, verse 13 where it says, For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Dust. Dust, not in the sense of something dry and powdery and very small particles, as far as um, when we what we think of dust first off today, as far as the word is used, but dust in the sense that it comes from the ground, because when the Lord forms man of the dust of the ground, it's really something that also has moisture to it. It's not something that's dry. Because another word that is used to describe what God created man from is clay. And of course, clay is dust, if you will, mixed with water. In our body, most of it is water. I can't remember the exact uh, percentage of composition, but it's uh, the majority of our body is water. Job 33.6 says this, Behold, I am according to thy wish, and God said, I also am 
formed out of the clay. Job referring to himself, but man in general, all of mankind. Humanity is formed out of the clay. So that's the dust here. Dust by definition, fine dry particles of earth, powder, surface of the ground. It's also figurative for something that's worthless, a state of humiliation. But we see again here that the dust here uh, that, that uh, formed man's body from the very beginning is that of clay. So it's dust and it's water together. Okay. The uh, underlying Hebrew word is afar. It's spelled A-P-A-R, if you're taking notes. It's pronounced afar. So the P there has like a P-H sound. Um, and that word is also translated not just as dust, but it's also translated earth and powder, ashes, and rubbish in our King James Bible. Very interesting. There are 16 chemicals in the human body that are also found in the soil. And that's because that's from whence we came. Very interesting. Now let's turn to Psalm 139. We mentioned that great chapter a while ago. Or Psalm 139, David, the psalmist, marveling at the intricacy and complexity uh, and, and just the marvel of the human body that God has created, even after the fall of man. And he talks about formation here in verses 13 through 15. Uh, Adam's formation being unique, since he is the, the first human being created. He was formed in the ground. The rest of us are formed in the womb. Formed nonetheless. So let's turn to Psalm 139, verses 13 through 15, where it says, For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. So you, me, in fact, every human being since Adam and Eve were formed in the womb. And by the way, formed by God. Formed by God. God working exactly as the genetic blueprint that he imparted at conception, working that all together. Um, note it says, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. The Lord did that. The Lord does that. Okay, so while it, uh, it may appear for all intensive purposes to be a natural process, that formation, that after conception has occurred and the book of DNA begins to be read, interpreted, and formation is, uh, uh, begins according to the book, it may appear to be completely natural. But God is the one who got that thing running, and God is the one who is intricately and directly involved in the process real time. So he is the one that's doing the formation. Verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy, are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And then in verse 15, it talks about Adam and the creation, the formation of the first man. My substance was not hid from thee when I, and of course, the psalmist David, uh, using the, the first person singular pronoun here, uh, not because God created him from the dust of the ground, but all of us were seminally, if you will, in Adam when God formed him. We were in him. The entire human race was in him when God formed him. So my substance was not hid from thee when I was in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. All right. So Adam formed in the ground. The rest of us formed in the womb. So the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. Isn't it interesting that God breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, not his mouth. You ever think about that? God breathes, so that's breath. It's coming from the mouth of God. 
And God is breathing his breath into the nostrils of man. He's not giving him mouth to mouth. He's giving him mouth to nose. Isn't that interesting? Mouth to nose, cessitation, as opposed to mouth to mouth, resuscitation. It's interesting to note that the best way to breathe is to inhale through the nostrils and exhale through the mouth. In, out. When you go to the doctor, they tell you to take deep breaths. They prefer, if not ask you, to breathe in through your nostrils. Take your breath in. Inhale. Exhale through your mouth. Why is that? It's because the way the Lord made us, we have filters in our nose. Filters, that's the hairs that are in our nose, filter out particles that are in the air that uh, really shouldn't be taken into our lungs. Filters that don't exist if you're breathing, inhaling with your mouth. Very interesting. Again, the Lord gave mouth-to-nose cessation. Now let's get back to this this statement here that and the and and the Lord God breathed into his nostrils. So God breathed. That expression, God breathed. The Greek term for that expression is theonustos. And it appears in the New Testament. Absolutely. And it's translated in 2 Timothy 3.16 as given by inspiration of God in reference to the scriptures. So what we have here by God breathing into man's nostrils, we have divine inspiration taking place. Absolutely. We have divine, an act of divine inspiration. The end result is not scripture in this case, but it's a man. It's all of humanity. Okay? This is huge. This gives us insight into the, the quality, for lack of a better term, of divine inspiration of the scriptures themselves. And we're going to explain that in detail here in just a moment. That's why I say we probably won't get off of verse 7. Uh, here tonight. But God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Let's go there first. Let's talk about the breath of life. This is coming from God. And we know in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit, or spirit in general, is likened to wind or breath. And so the breath of God is the spirit of God. God's breathing directly into man. And the result is that man's spirit is now created, coming directly from God. And this combination of this body formed by the hand of God and this spirit created by the breath of God means that you have this unique creature now uh, by the Lord, which is a human being, a living or eternal soul, an eternal being, made and formed in his image. Wow. Wow. No other creature like him. Job 27, 3, all the while my breath is in me, the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. So very interesting. The Spirit of God is that breath the Lord breathed into man. That it was divine inspiration, pretty clear by the next couple of verses. Well, the next uh, verses we'll be looking at. The first of them being Job 33, 4. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. See that? 
the breath of the Almighty defined in that verse right there as the Spirit of God. We're going to get to Job 32 in just a moment. That shows that that is divine inspiration. But a couple of more verses on the spirit of man coming from God being something that's created by God. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, referring to the body of man. And the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So at death, I mean, that's just the way it goes. Um, it goes back to its source. So the body returns to the ground, the spirit back to God who gave it. Isaiah 42, 5, thus saith, the, thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. So note there, the end of the verse, breath is defined as spirit. Very interesting. Uh, I think we have some more. How about Ezekiel 37, verses 5 and 6 and 10 here. In the vision of the valley of dry bones, uh, thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Just like we're reading here in Genesis 2, verse 7, where God breathes into the nostrils of man the breath of life. And what happens? He becomes alive. He's a living soul. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. So there it is again. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now this breath is defined for us here. Verse number 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet in exceeding great army. Actually, that doesn't define it. We didn't put down the right verse there. Um, nothing wrong with those verses we just showed you, but um, we want to share with you, um, uh, which verse is it here? Yeah, verse 14 of Ezekiel 37. And shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. So yeah, we got to make sure verse 14 of Ezekiel 37 is mentioned in addition to these verses we have up on the screen. So verse 14, that breath that God puts in them there is the Spirit of God. And then we mentioned Job 33, 4. Here it is. So, uh, or I'm sorry, we mentioned Job 32, 8. Here it is, along with Job 33, 4 that we mentioned earlier. You have the Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. That's Job 33, 4. So the breath of God is defined as the Spirit of God. But now in Job 32, 8, that Spirit that God put in us was by virtue of divine inspiration. Job 32, 8, but there is a Spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Amazing. So we're going to learn again some things about the act of divine inspiration, the quality of it, the scope of it, okay? Uh, things regarding the scriptures, the inspired scriptures, what that means, truly what it means, because we have the example, the precedent of the creation of man right before us to teach us. So now the word breath, the underlying Hebrew word is neshama, neshama. If you're taking notes, that's N-E-S-H-A-M-A, -A, pronounced Neshama. And that word appears 24 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. And in our King James Bible, it's not only translated as breath or breathe or breathed, but it's also translated as blast three times, spirit twice, and inspiration one time just to name a few. It's called the breath of life, that which God breathed into us, the breath of life. The word life 
is the word we've looked at before. It's the Hebrew word hay. It's, it's spelled H-A-Y, so it looks like our word hay, but it's pronounced hay or hay. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, the word means to live, means life. It can also mean beast or creature, living thing, and so on. Now, this breath of life is in our nostrils, according to Genesis 7.22. And it's also called our breath. In Isaiah 2, verse 22, in Lamentations 4, in verse number 20. Animals also have the breath of life. We know that because in Genesis 7.22, the Lord says he's going to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life upon the earth. Well, the Lord didn't, didn't just destroy human beings, but all the animal creation too. Any and all of the physical creation that was not in the ark. Okay, The difference between the breath of life that is in animals and that which is in human beings is that we received our breath of life directly, directly from the Lord. Direct inspiration from God. Animals did not receive their breath because God directly breathed into their nostrils. That's not how they got their breath. It's how we got ours, though, directly from God direct inspiration. So the Lord created the spirit of man by the breath of his mouth. Now the breath of life is one of many things in the Bible that are mentioned as being of life. So again, we have the breath of life. What other things of life are mentioned in the Bible? Uh, well, again, many things. And we have the first part of that list up on the screen for you now to look at. We'll run through these really quickly. We've had the, the list up for a bit here. So if you're wanting to uh, jot down references and look these up yourself. Uh, but you have I mean, order of appearance in the Bible. You have the breath of life, of course, right here in Genesis 2-7. The next thing that, we, uh, that we'll see is the tree of life. That's in verse 9. The Bible mentions the time of life, Genesis 18.10. The bundle of life, 1 Samuel 25.29. The path or paths of life, first appearing in Psalm 16.11. The fountain of life, Psalm 36 and verse 9. The issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. The way or the ways of life first appearing in Proverbs 6.23. A well of life or wellspring of life, Proverbs 10.11. The reproof of life, Proverbs 15.31. The statutes of life, Ezekiel 33.15. Then in the New Testament, we have the resurrection of life in John 5.29. The bread of life, referring to the Lord Jesus, John 6.35. The light of life, again, referring to the Lord Jesus in John 8, and verse number 12. The prince of life, again, a reference to Jesus, Acts 3.15. The manner of life, Acts 26.4. The newness of life, Romans 6.4. The spirit of life, Romans 8.2. The savor of life, 2 Corinthians 2.16. The Word of Life, Philippians 2.16. The Book of Life, Philippians 4, verse 3. The Promise of Life, 2 Timothy 1, verse 1. We have the End of Life, Hebrews 7, verse 3. The Crown of Life, James 1.12. The Grace of Life, 1 Peter 3.17. I'm sorry, 1 Peter 3.7. The Pride of Life. 1 John 2 and verse number 16. And then the water of life, 
first mentioned in Revelation 21 and verse number 6. So those are the things of life. 27 of them in total. It's quite a list. Quite a study, if you'd like to undertake. All right, so what happens? God forms man of the dust of the ground. He makes his body out of the dust, out of the clay. He breathes into his nostrils. He gives him mouth-to-nose suscitation. And by virtue of this, creates the very spirit of man inside this body. But the combination of this spirit and this body, the spirit created by the breath of God and the body formed by the hand of God, results in something else, a living soul. A living soul. So the soul is distinct from the body, from the spirit. We're going to discuss that in significant detail here. Not just tonight, but we'll pick it up as well next time. And man becomes a living soul. I like to think of this expression, living soul, being comparable to eternal being. Because the soul that comes into being at this point, like the spirit, is immaterial and it's eternal. It never ceases to exist. We're going to talk more about the difference between the body, soul, and spirit in just a moment. But it says, and man became a living soul. It doesn't say, and the man became a living soul, although that's true. But it says, and man became a living soul. And that's because it's not just the first man that was a living soul. It's all men. Adam, Eve taken out of his side, all of their descendants and offspring, all the way up to the present day, including you and me, and anybody else who's here to come. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 45 says, And so it was written, the first, at, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Okay? So the word man here is not just Adam, but it's a reference to all men. All men, because we were all in Adam, except Jesus, of course, but all in Adam. Okay? One divine act of inspiration. Remember we said God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. God breathed. That's inspiration. Theonustos. Okay? One divine act of inspiration ensured eternal perpetuity. What do we mean by that? Once God breathed into the first man, he became a living soul. The act of breathing into the nostrils of man did not have to be repeated. For every child subsequently born. Some people actually disagree with that and believe that God breathes into the nostrils of every baby born in this world at the moment they're born. They believe that. We'll talk more about that theory next week. Okay? I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. I don't. I don't believe the act of divine inspiration has to be repeated. That the result of God breathing into Adam, the first man, was that man, not just Adam, but all of his descendants are living souls. God doesn't have to breathe into anybody's nostrils hereafter for them to become a living soul. They are a living soul at the moment of conception. And so that's what we mean by perpetuity. One original creative act of God guaranteed its perpetuity. Ecclesiastes 3.14 says, whatsoever God doeth, it is forever. And so once that, 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 that being comes into existence, they never cease to exist. Whether they become fully f formed in the womb and are born into this world or not. Whether they're born into this world and learn to walk and talk or not whether they're born and, and learn to walk and talk and 
come to the age of accountability or not. It doesn't matter. Once conceived, that being is in existence forever. And God did not have to breathe into those nostrils. In some instances, maybe nostrils haven't even been formed yet. It doesn't matter. The unique soul and spirit of that individual, that soul, that person, that being, is imparted at the moment of conception. And so, one divine act ensures this continual, this, this perpetuity of living souls. And so, if it's present in creation and procreation, then the same would be true about inspiration of Scripture and preservation of Scripture. See? Man is not a living soul because God continues to breathe into nostrils every single baby that's born. He did it once and only had to do it once. And everything, everything's imparted at that moment. Okay? Every human being is equally a living soul as Adam was through procreation. And so we're saying the same truth regarding that inspiration of man is true in regard to inspiration of the Scripture. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. No prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, right? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, The Scriptures are inspired as they were originally given. But that inspiration, the quality that makes them infallible, inerrant, was not lost when those original manuscripts penned by Moses, David, Isaiah, Paul, John, those original writings, when they perished, the inspiration, the quality that made them the very word of God, infallible and inerrant, did not perish with the paper, with the, uh, with those, with the manuscript. It, it didn't perish. Nothing as far as that quality was lost during the copying process and even during translation. Because just like procreation, there's no subsequent need for another inspiration for the end result to be the same as the original. I hope that's making sense to all of you. Now, that doesn't mean that every single copy of Scripture is the Word of God, infallible and errant, and every single translation is, because that's not the case. We know the devil has produced counterfeit manuscripts and counterfeit translations from those manuscripts. But we believe that our King James Bible and the texts underlying it, the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek Textus Receptus, are the divinely preserved texts for Hebrew, Greek, and English. And therefore, they are the infallible, inerrant Word of God in their respective languages. And they are no less the Word of God than the very manuscripts penned by inspiration by Moses, David, Isaiah, Paul, and John at all. Okay? Equally authoritative. Equally inspired in the Word of God. But given to us by preservation not by direct inspiration. Just like I'm a living soul, just as you are, not because God breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. So we didn't get this way through creation. We got this way through procreation. I hope that makes sense. Very important to get that. Because a lot of people believe, a lot of people believe, that no translation can be inspired. Cannot be. No copy can be inspired. Only the originals. I, 
I can't begin to tell you the, I, I would say 99% of church doctrinal statements out there, 99%. I think it's safe to say that. Make it clear that only the originals are, are, give, are, are inspired. Only the originals are given by the process of direct inspiration. But that does not mean that your King James Bible, as an example, isn't inspired. It is infallible. It is inerrant. It has the same quality as the original manuscripts from whence it came, through the process of divine preservation. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up here, and we're going to have to wrap it up with what you're seeing on the screen right now by introducing what we're going to talk about in great detail next time. And that's the fact that man is a tripartite being. Very clear right here early in the Bible, we see the Lord God forming man, his body of the dust of the ground. So there's his body. Breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. There's the creation of the spirit of man, and man becomes a living soul. There's the soul. So the three parts of man, very distinctly, not just in one place, but in numerous places, detailed in scriptures, are the body, which essentially gives us world consciousness, the soul, which gives us self-consciousness, and the spirit, which enables man, gives man God consciousness. And so we'll, we'll close with this, seeing an example in the death of Jesus Christ. In Luke 23, 43, we see a mention, indirectly, of his soul. And Jesus says to the penitent thief here, he says, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Well, it can't be referring to Jesus' body, because his body is going to go into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. The, the body of the penitent thief was not put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Paradise is Abraham's bosom located in the heart of the earth at the time. The Lord is obviously referring to his soul and the soul of the penitent thief. Then we see the body mentioned in verse 52. This man, referring to Joseph of Arimathea, went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it. Note, it doesn't say he took him down and wrapped him in linen. It says he took it, the body of Jesus. Jesus isn't in the body. He's in the heart of the earth at this point. He took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. So the, at death, the soul of the Lord Jesus goes into the heart of the earth. At death, his body goes into the sepulcher of Joseph of Arimathea. And then what about the spirit? Going back up to verse 46 of Luke 23. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And that's because, according to Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, the spirit goes back to God who gave it. So the body of Jesus into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the soul into the heart of the earth, the spirit back to God the Father. All three parts of man distinctly, distinctly mentioned here in Luke 23. And we'll see more next time. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll stop there. And we're going to take a, a, just a brief break to prepare for hour number two. Hopefully you'll be able to stick with us. So we'll see you in just a few minutes, folks.